Good evening, friends. Stephen Bernoon here with Israeli News Live. And, uh, you know, this evening is kind of a, a message I've spoke about before, but I'm going to go a little deeper on this one here. And uh, it's kind of a message that really makes you think, or at least I'm wanting you to think. I'm wanting you to think very deeply uh, about what I'm going to share with you here. Don't just look at this as from the, from the surface, but really think deeply. You know, we're living here in this last day, and as we live here in this last day, there's so many things that are going on in the world, and there's so much, so much in the scriptures that we overlook, that we don't pay attention to closely. So I'm hoping that uh, this evening, as I talk to you about some of the scriptures here in John's Gospel, chapter 8, also chapter 10, we'll be looking at Paul in Galatians, the book of Ezra, the book of Romans, and also Paul in the book of Acts. And I'm really wanting you to do some very deep thinking as I share this information with you. So let's get started here. In chapter 8 of the book of John, we read this. Then Jesus said, and I'm using the New King James Version on this, on this particular uh, chapter and uh, I think one other also in chapter 10. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. And therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my words has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do that what you have seen with your father. Notice the differentiation right there. Jesus is clearly showing you that his father is not the same as their father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, we were, born, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. The desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in, in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's word, therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. Now what's fascinating, they claim that the same God that Jesus would be claiming for himself, the Father, was actually their Father, their God as well. But Jesus clearly showed that, that was not their God. He clearly demonstrated that Satan was their God. All right? Think about that now. Just 
I want you to think seriously about that. And as we, as you think about that and meditate on that just for a moment here, let's move over here to John chapter 10. I'm going to begin right here at the very ver verse one. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings them out of his own, uh, brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Makes me wonder how many people really understand even now what he's talking about. We'll continue on verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, and if any man enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now keep in mind now, all those that came before Jesus are thieves and robbers. Think about that. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You remember I've shared with you guys when you go back to Genesis and you have the two trees in the midst of the garden. You have the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You have the tree of life. And as I have often said, Jesus Christ is the tree of life. I've pointed out to you before how that the law is under the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because the law shows you both good and evil. The, the law also requires death. Think about it. Jesus said in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by my own. The father knows me. Even so I know the father and lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and they there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment I have received from my father. Now think about it. All that came before him are thieves and robbers. And what did he say the thief and the robber does? He only came to do what? To steal and to kill and to destroy. Not one time, though, does those thieves or robbers ever come and actually give their lives. But instead, they are requiring blood. They are requiring death. Like I said, you have to think deeply for a moment here. Now, we're going to probably jump back to some of these, but I want you to just, let's move on. Let's look at this a little bit more. 
In Galatians chapter 3, beginning with verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression to the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Think about that. Ordained by angels. By the way, that is in the plural, the word angels. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are no longer in a situation where the thief only comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. If you look at Ezra, watch what Ezra writes here in chapter 7. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thy hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye him that knoweth them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed upon him with all diligence, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers who hath put such things as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Think about that. And then we read, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he is he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Hmm. What does he say in verse 10? The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And over in chapter 8, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father. You do that what you have seen with your father. What they want to do to him? Kill him. Jesus clearly made a differentiation between his father and their father. Jesus said to them, if you were of Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. And Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born in fornication. They're letting him know that they are not Nephilim bloodlines, but they were Nephilim bloodlines. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. And why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. In the Greek language, it is an absolute right there. It is, there is no way possible for them to hear his word. Totally impossible. Watch what Paul says here in Romans. 
For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, there's a lot of people who have a lot of opinions about this. You know, Jesus had to come and die in order. No, 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 no. That's not what it's about. In this case here, her husband is the law. That's one way to look at it. Just one way to look at it. See, she's bound to her husband so long as her husband liveth. And she's bound by the law, Mosaic law. That was delivered by what? Angels. Remember when Jesus said, you have heard it said of them of old time? Think about that. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But he says, I say unto you, if they take your coat, give him your cloak also. If he compels you to go a mile, go with him twain. Remember that? I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you to think deeply because there's a lot of things that were written. And yet the scripture tells us where it comes from. But nobody seems to pay attention. So then, verse 3, if her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So you know the one that you're being married to is Jesus Christ. But if you still embrace the law, you're an adulterer. You are living in adultery. if you still are trying to live under the law. Now, I know that they have this crazy thought that, and I've seen this before, I knew the Jehovah's Witnesses people believe this, and then I found out Perry Stone also taught the same thing. In fact, when Perry Stone's wife asked me for the book that I wrote, Israel, Are They Still God's People? It was kind of interesting because they read the book and didn't want anything to do with me afterwards, but I didn't know that Perry taught that. But in my book that I wrote, Israel, They Still God's People, I addressed that false doctrine that uh, Yahweh is, is uh, the, the husband to Israel and Jesus is the husband of the Gentiles. That, that don't even make sense. Now, in part, I might agree with that partially, but actually, what the truth of the matter is, Israel is married to the devil. Jesus clearly said to the Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Now, you got to take it up with him, not with me. That's what he said. But if you were to say that the father was their husband, then what right would Jesus have to come and take his father's wife? That would be, he would have to be put to death for that. Because according to the law, you were not allowed to have, a son cannot have his father's wife. It is against the law. And we can't say that Jesus is the husband of the Gentiles because it was the apostles that actually believed upon him and they became married to him. So what husband has to be dead? The law. The law of sin and death. The law that Israel was under, the schoolmaster. 
Verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. So the only fruit that you can get when you're under the law is death. What do they mean by death? Well, every time you do something wrong, they kill a sheep, they kill a goat, they kill a bird. Everything's about death. And then you wonder what John is talking about. The thief does nothing. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. Now, let's back up. Verse 7. Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who have ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Why doesn't the law save them? The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And yet, I mean, this one over here in Ezra just kind of blew me away anyway. I mean, think about it. And whoever will not do the law of thy God, the law of the king, let the judgment be executed upon him with all diligence, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. Is anybody awake? So we go on. But now we all are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So there's a good point in that. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. All right? Verse 9, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know not that the law is spirit, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. And for what I should, would, that I do not, but that I hate, that I do. Or that do I, excuse me. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Not then it is not more that I do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if, that, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There it is. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, I want to read to you from Acts. Which of the prophets, we're in chapter 7 of Acts, by the way, verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers. 
who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. What were they cut to the heart about? Was it the fact that they had received the law from angels or the fact that they're being accused that they didn't keep the law? Which one? Which one is it? Let's read and see. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up. And this is Stephen, by the way. The, uh, the apostle, or excuse me, uh, Stephen, the, uh, Stephen was a deacon. Who looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, and the Lord lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. But why were they so angry at him? Why? He accused them of betraying and murdering Jesus Christ. He said that they're stiff-necked, uncircumcised, and hard ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you. Again, they're clearly their God was not the Father of Jesus Christ. This is really what I'm trying to get you to look at. That, and of course the fact that if you don't want to be an adulterer, you will have to put away the law. Because Christ is the only door to the sheepfold. And only his sheep hear his voice. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. Friend, the wolves are coming. The wolf is coming. The devil himself is coming. But by the way, that devil that is coming, that wolf that is coming, they're going to tell you he's the Messiah. They might even tell you this is Yahweh. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Isn't it interesting that in the Messianic community, you have a lot of the Messianic ministers that are wanting you to go up underneath Talmudic rabbis of today. And saying to you as believers that you need to receive instruction from these rabbis. The very descendants of the Pharisees, I mean, the Orthodox rabbis tell you they are descendants of the Pharisees and you're to sit under them whom Jesus said, ye are of your father the devil, and his works you will do. And as I will remind you, according to John chapter 8, when Jesus says here, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Literally, he says, it is impossible for you to hear. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. Talking about their father. Isn't that interesting too? He, he says he's a murderer from the beginning. And that's one that really ought to make people think. He's not talking about Cain and Abel. He's talking about Satan. 
but he said he was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Like I said, these things are very deep and really, really, it should make you stop and think. You know, I read a lot of times scriptures like this, you know, kind of like the one I, I shared with you guys a little while back, right? I don't know if you guys remember this or not. You remember when Jesus was, was talking about, um, let me just pull it up. And I, and I asked you to really think about this, right? Really wanted you to think about, you know, um, when he said to them, which of you being evil, right? Let me see if I can pull that up. Oh, this is not going to be easy. Maybe I can. Maybe we can. Here we go. I think I got it now. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7. I wonder if I can find that in the Hebrew. Uh, the Hebrew uh, Matthew. Let me just see if we can find that, that particular. Um, let me see if I can find that real quick. Because that would actually be much better if I could find that Dead Sea Scrolls. No, not that. Uh, there we go. Hebrew. That's the dual toilet Hebrew math. Here we go. George Howard right there. Let's see if we can do this. Thing. We want to go to Matthew 7. I think that's where I found that at. Yeah. The only reason I'm looking at the Hebrew version of this is because sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes you can get some very interesting, uh, here we go, get some interesting insights with this. And let's see, what verse was that in? That is actually in the ninth verse. Maybe begin a little bit before that. Uh, again, he said to them, do not give holy flesh to dogs, nor place or place your pearls before the swine, lest they chew them before you, and turned and rend you. Ask from God, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks will receive by the one who seeks. It will be found. And to the one who calls, it will be opened. Who is there among you whose son asks him for a piece of bread and he gives him a stone? Or if he should ask him for a fish, he gives him a snake? But if you being evil come to a place, good gifts before yourselves, so much the more your father who is in heaven will give his good spirit to those who seek him. Everything you wish that men should do to you, do to them. This is the Torah. This is the words of the prophets. Now, if you remember, I said to you, think about what Jesus said there. And think deeply. He's actually referring back to the time when Israel was in the wilderness journey. You remember when they were complaining? Oh, they remembered the melons and the fish. And God got angry at them and sent serpents. When Jesus was here and 
they were up in Galilee there, and they were hungry. Jesus told his apostles, sit them down and let's feed them. But they didn't, they didn't have anything. The little boy had what, two loaves of bread and a, and a few fish. But Jesus took and blessed it and asked the Father, and the Father multiplied the bread and the fish. Sometimes it takes some really sincere examination. But I will tell you this. When Jesus Christ came, he was the fullness of everything. He was our all in all, and we have no need of anyone else. I think that's why that scripture is so beautiful about the woman, the adulterer. Because I think, was that the one in Romans here? I forget now, right off the top of my head there. Yeah. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. We need to sincerely recognize the gift that Jesus Christ gave unto us. I know there's so many people that are longing to embrace the roots of their ancestry, or they'll say, you know, Jesus was a Hebrew, and he did this and he did that. but yet he so much was trying to get you to see something. And I think that something was more of the law of love, not of a carnal commandment where there is no life. As Paul said, the law, it served a purpose. It was a schoolmaster. We're in a late hour, friends. And if we don't really get serious before him and truly know, one, who we are, who you are, and who your Savior is, we're going to find ourselves in a very difficult situation the deception that is coming upon this earth will engulf people like never before. If we embrace the law in that regards, we will be swallowed up by the Antichrist system because they will bring you the law. They will bring you a figure after all this calamity that strikes this earth. That figure will come out of Jerusalem and many will be deceived by it. I really encourage you, if you do not know Jesus Christ as truly your perpetuation for sins, your salvation, his own life being imparted back upon you. Take the time and pray and seek him until you know that you have heard his voice and a stranger you will never follow. I'm Stephen Benoon. Trust this is a blessing to you in some way. If you'd like to support the work we do, we thank you for that. Our website is IsraeliNewsLive.org. On the top of the video, you can see uh, my name and, of course, our address if you prefer to support by mail. 
or you can support online. Thank you for your love and kindness, and God bless you.